now to the area of land use control, because this is what is affecting us in the United States and will have profound effect on the United States as much or more than any of the other three areas. And this is the area that I and the organizations I represent uh, spend most of our time working on. In the United States, a few hundred years ago, our founders set out on an experimental journey. But at the very foundation of that journey was the principle of land ownership. You know the battle, I trust, between the Hobbesian philosophy and the Rousseau mentality that says that people should live under the rule of a benevolent dictator who holds all land and resources in common and determines who shall have access to what land. Which is vitally different from the Lockean view that says uh, ownership falls to the first possessor. And private ownership is the foundation for the pursuit of individual achievement and excellence. And in the United States, we gravitated toward that Lockean philosophy. And it is that philosophy and that understanding of private property ownership and the use of those resources that teaches us stewardship that has allowed the United States to develop an economy and prosperity the likes of which the world has never known. And the rest of the world resents it. But it has freed mankind. It has opened our creative intellect. It has allowed us to solve problems that for millennia have been unsolvable. And it promises a future <laughs> beyond our wildest imaginations if we can only keep our country on that principle of private property ownership. But there are those in this world who think that we are destroying our planet. There are those in this world that think our survival depends upon a managed society. In 1976, a group of those people met in Vancouver, British Columbia. It was called the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements, Habitat One. Representing the United States was one William K. Riley, who became known as Bill Riley, Chief of the Environmental Protection uh, Administration at one time, or EPA. Environmental Protection Agency. Also, representing the United States, was one Carla Hill, who became the chief trade negotiator responsible for the Uruguay Round, out of which came the World Trade Organization. For the very first time in history, the United Nations set forth in writing its policy on land and land use. You can read an analysis of that 65-page segment of the agenda at our website, and I urge you to look it up. But I'll share with you just a couple of sentences from the preamble to give you an idea of the flavor of that document. It says, land cannot be considered as an ordinary uh, asset subject to the inefficiencies of the marketplace. This private ownership of land is a cause for the accumulation of wealth and therefore contributes to social injustice. Public control of land use is therefore indispensable. And the United States signed on to that document. And you may remember back in the 70s while this hoopla was going on in Vancouver, British Columbia. There was a movement afoot in the United States to uh, build, in fact, 
to create a comprehensive federal land use planning act. Some of you remember. Some of you remember the sagebrush rebellion that arose to ultimately defeat both of those initiatives at federal land use planning. But the proponents of that philosophy didn't quit just because they were defeated. They chose another route. And for the last 30 years, we have been experiencing the implementation of federal land use planning and federal land use control. But the international community was a little more brazen. They set out through a number of initiatives to formalize and codify international control of land use. In 1979, UNESCO and the State Department entered into a memorandum of agreement to participate in the Man and the Biosphere program and created within the bowels of the State Department, and I use that term advisedly, was created a program called the Man and the Biosphere program. And over the next 10 years, there were created in the United States 47 biosphere reserves, United Nations biosphere reserves. UNESCO designated 47 biosphere reserves in the United States. A part of the 411 biosphere reserves that have been designated around the world. Now back during the 70s, there was a guy named Dave Foreman working for the Wilderness Society as a lobbyist. Hold up your hand if the name Dave Foreman means anything to you. Very good. Those of you who didn't raise your hand will have to stay after school. You need to become familiar with this gentleman. He wrote a book in 1990 called uh, uh, Confessions of an Eco Warrior. He was a co-founder of Earth First. He's a convicted eco-terrorist. And as a part of his plea bargain uh, arrangement, he left Earth First to create a new organization called the Cenozoic Society, which publishes a magazine called Wild Earth. And in 1992, it published the Wildlands Project. Hold up your hand if you are familiar with the Wildlands Project. Okay, that's good. But for the rest of you, I want to take you a little bit deeper into the Wildlands Project. In his book, Dave Foreman, in 1990, Dave Foreman says, I have a vision of wilderness where grizzly bears and wolves can roam from Mexico to Canada without having to cross a highway. Okay, that's not a bad vision if, you know, you've been on drugs. I laughed when I read it. And then in 1992, when Wild Earth was published, the vision gained a little credibility when it was put in the language of Dr. Reed Noss, a biologist from the University of Florida and other universities, who wrote The Wildlands Project in academic language, which said that we may be able to save the planet if at least half of the land area of the lower 48 states is converted to wilderness. Out of bounds to human beings. Providing that most of the rest of the land is managed for conservation objectives. Now think about that just for a little bit. Half the land area, out of bounds or off limits to human beings, 
Most of the rest of the land managed by government for conservation objectives. The wilderness areas surrounded by buffer zones that are connected by corridors of wilderness. Even in 1992, although it was getting a, a little more academic, thought it was still kind of hilarious, didn't pay an awful lot of attention to it, until the Sierra Club published in 1994 its vision of the United States in which there were no longer 50 states but 20 eco-regions. I saw this thing beginning to get a little out of hand. Then comes the Convention on Biological Diversity in 1994. Two, actually, it arrived at the U.S. Senate in 1994. George Bush won, or 41, refused to sign the Convention on Biological Diversity, although he did sign the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it was ratified rather quickly. The Convention on Biological Diversity was not signed by Mr. Bush, but never mind, Mr. Gore, through his surrogate, Bill Clinton, did sign the Convention on Biodiversity and assumed that it would be ratified. So you remember when he set out to reinvent government? What that really meant as far as land use and resource management agencies was to restructure in order to implement the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we created a whole new policy in the federal government called ecosystem management. And for the very first time, the protection of ecosystems achieved the same priority as the protection of human health, as is set forth in the internal working documents of the EPA. For the very first time, the internal working documents of the Department of Interior said that human beings will be considered as a biological resource in ecosystem management. Now that should really boil your water. I think most of us consider ourselves to be a little more than a biological resource. But our federal government doesn't. This is in print and in the Clinton era, our entire resource management agencies of the federal government shifted to implementing the Convention on Biological Diversity. Never mind that the Senate refused to ratify it. <clears throat> the Convention on Biological Diversity is an 18-page, very easy to read, uh, UN speak kind of document that you can read it and maybe stay awake to the end of page 18. Really doesn't mean a whole lot. For example, in Article 2 it says, every nation shall create a system of protected areas. Well, when I read that in the treaty, it didn't concern me at all because the United States has a massive system of protected areas. National parks, wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, we had plenty. But the instruction book for implementing the 18-page treaty is 1140 pages. It's called the Global Biodiversity Assessment. And on page 993 of this massive document, it says the Wildlands Project published in the United States in 1992 is the central focus of the implementation of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, when I saw that in the United Nations document, I thought, there's got to be something going on here. And there really is. Because of the United States, our agencies of federal government and state government are implementing the Wildlands Project just as quickly as we possibly can. Now, if we're going to drive people off the land to achieve this 50% wilderness and drive people off the land to achieve these government-managed buffer zones, where are they going to go? Have you heard of sustainable communities? <laughs> 